Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnava Bio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare <coughs> Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the Sri Ishopanishad. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. All right. So this evening we're beginning mantra number 14. Try to find my glasses, wait. <laughs> All right, mantra number 14. Sambutim cha vinashyam cha yastat vedo vayam saha vinashinam ritjam tirva sambutyam ritamashnate. Translation, one should know perfectly the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, and his transcendental name, form, qualities, and pastimes as well as the temporary material creation with its temporary demigods, men and animals. When one knows these, he surpasses death and the ephemeral cosmic manifestation with it. And in the eternal kingdom of God, he enjoys his eternal life of bliss and knowledge. So this mantra 14 continues from mantra 12 and 13 <coughs> discussing worship of different gods and demigods so in this mantra we learn we should know lord krishna along with his transcendental name form qualities pastime but we also have to know about the temporary material creation with its temporary demigods, men and animals. So it's not just only know Krishna, but we should know also Krishna's par parts and parcels. When one knows these, he surpasses death and the ephemeral cosmic manifestation with it. And in the eternal kingdom of God, enjoys his eternal life of bliss and knowledge so the goal is to go back out of this material world to get out and to go back to godhead this is the desirable situation we'll read Prabhupada's purport by its so-called advancement of knowledge human civilization has created many material things including spaceships and atomic energy. Just a minute. Yet it has failed to create a situation in which people need not die, take birth again, become old or suffer from disease. Whenever an intelligent man raises the question of these miseries before a so-called scientist, the scientist will very cleverly, the scientist very cleverly replies that material science is progressing and that ultimately it will be possible to render man deathless, ageless, 
and diseaseless. Such answers prove the scientist's gross ignorance of material nature. In material nature, everyone is under the stringent laws of matter and must pass through six stages of existence, birth, growth, maintenance, production of byproducts, deterioration, and finally death. No one in contact with material nature can be beyond these six laws of transformation. Therefore, no one, whether demigod, man, animal, or plant, can survive forever in the material world. So Srila Prabhupada is graphically describing to us the laws of material nature that everyone who takes birth in the material world is going to be subject to the transformations, to the changes, and the ultimate destruction of the material body. Hi, Ma. Back home already. All right, we ask people, you know, if you have people beside you, you have to mute yourself. Srila Prabhupada continues, the duration of life varies according to species. Lord Brahma, the chief living being within this material universe, lives for millions and millions of years, while a minute germ lives for some hours only. But no one in the material world can survive eternally. Things are born of, or created under certain conditions. They stay for some time, and if they continue to live, they grow, procreate, gradually dwindle, and finally vanish. According to these laws, even the Brahmas, of which there are millions in different universes, are all liable to death, either today or tomorrow. Therefore, the entire material universe is called Martyaloka, the place of death. Positive. Yeah, can, can we mute everyone, please? They told her she's very positive. Hare Krishna, can we mute everyone? Who's the host? I don't want to hear people talking. Prabhupada continues, material scientists and politicians are trying to make this place deathless because they have no information of the deathless spiritual nature. This is due to their ignorance of the Vedic literature, which contains full knowledge confirmed by mature transcendental experience. Unfortunately, modern man is averse to receiving knowledge from the Vedas, Puranas, and other scriptures. So Srila Prabhupada is describing the problem and trying to present spiritual knowledge. That the materialistic scientists and politicians think they can conquer over the laws of material nature. Just like Haranyakashi Pu, the great demon, tried to make himself immortal. So in the, in the modern times, we have tiny people, tiny demons, like scientists, material scientists, and sometimes even politicians. And they want to create the a deathless planet in the material world. But it's not possible. If we want to enjoy a deathless environment, we have to go out of the material nature. We have to enter into the spiritual realm, into the transcendental world, beyond birth and death. So this is the challenge facing all of us conditioned souls 
that if we want to escape the material nature, we have to get out of the material world. And to get out of the material world, the scriptures are there to guide us. The scriptures, like the Puranas and the Vedas, they give us information of how we can transfer ourselves out of this material world. So Srila Prabhupada just continues, from the Vishnu Purana, we receive the following information. Vishnu Shakti Para Prokta, Shetra Gnakya Tatapara, Avidya Karma Samgyanya, Tritiya Shakti Ishyate. Lord Vishnu, the personality of Godhead, possesses different energies known as para and apara. The living entities belong to the superior energy, in other words, the para, the material energy in which we are presently entangled is the inferior energy. The material creation is made possible by this energy which covers the living entities with ignorance, avidya, and induces them to perform fruitive activities. Yet there is another part of the Lord's superior energy that is different from both this material, inferior energy and the living entities. That superior energy constitutes the eternal, deathless abode of the Lord. And this is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Parastasmattu bhavanyo vyakto vyaktat sanatanaha yasasarveshu bhuteshu nashyatsu navinashyati. All the material planets, upper, lower, and intermediate, including the sun, the moon, and Venus, are scattered throughout the universe. These planets exist only during the lifetime of Brahma. Some lower planets, however, are vanquished after the end of one day of Brahma and are again created during the next day of Brahma. On the upper planets, Time is calculated differently. One of our years is equal to only 24 hours or one day and night on many of the upper planets. The four ages of Earth, Satya, Treta, Dwapara and Kali, last only 12,000 years according to the time scale of the upper planets. Such a length of time multiplied by 1,000 constitutes one day of Brahma, and one night of Brahma is the same. Such days and nights accumulate into months and years, and Brahma lives for 100 such years. At the end of Brahma's life, the complete universal manifestation is vanquished. So Srila Prabhupada is describing to us the information which is given in the scriptures about the spiritual world. First of all, he explains that there are two en there's two kinds of energies. There's the superior and there's the inferior energy. The material energy is the inferior energy. And the superior energy is the spiritual energy. The living entities are meant to belong to the superior energy. But due to our conditioned state, due to our ignorance, we come in contact with the material energy. Then Srila Prabhupada goes on and quotes the Bhagavad Gita, how in the Bhagavad Gita we learn that there's a planet above all the planets in the material world, there's a region where the living entities are deathless. 
So that region is described as the kingdom of God, the abode of the Lord. And it's beyond all material nature. So it's described as sanatana. In other words, it's eternally existing. In the material world, the sun and the moon, they're, they're not going to be, they're not eternal. They're finished with the life of Brahma. But there's an, a, an abode, the region in the spiritual sky where there are planets, where the Lord lives in his different incarnations, in his different forms. So these planets exist in the material world, the planets exist for the life of Brahma. And not all of them last the life of Brahma. The lower planets are finished at the end of every day of Brahma. In the lower regions, they are annihilated at the end of one, Brahma's one day. Of course, one day of Brahma is a long time. It's in Bhagavad Gita, it says, Sahasra Yuga Paryantam Aharyat Brahmano Vidu. One thousand ages taken together is one day. So one day is equal to only 24 hours. But there are different levels of time. What one of our years is equal to 24 hours on the upper planets. That's one year is equal to one day on other on this planet on on the upper planets. So the four ages, meaning the Satya Treta, Dwapara and Kali, they last only twelve thousand years on the higher planets. But the Kali Yuga is 432,000 years. And if you add the, the four ages together, Satya, Treta, Dwapara, and Kali, then it's 4,320,000 years. But on the higher planets, it's only 12,000 years. So there's a big difference in the scale of time. One day of Brahma is equal to 1,000 ages. So Brahma lives 100 years, and at the end of Brahma's life, then everything is annihilated. Srila Prabhupada continues, Those living beings who reside on higher planets like the sun and the moon as well as those on Martyaloka, this earth planet, and also those who live on lower planets, all are merged into the waters of devastation during the night of Brahma. During this time, no living beings or species remain manifest, although spiritually they continue to exist. So Srila Prabhupada is describing what happens during the night of Brahma. So there's a partial devastation. And that partial devastation, partial annihilation includes the earth, the earth our earthly region, which is described as Marjaloka, the planet of death. So we're we're annihilated and the lower lower planets are also they're all merged into the waters of devastation and then you have the night of brahma and then when the day comes again then again there's these places are recreated so when there's the partial devastation during this time no living being of our species remain manifest although spiritually they continue to exist. This unmanifested stage is called avyakta. Again, when the entire universe is vanquished at the end of Brahma's lifetime, 
there is another of yakta state, but beyond these two unmanifested states is another unmanifested state, the spiritual atmosphere or nature. So there's the avyakta, the unmanifested stage. But with the creation again, then they become manifest. The entire universe is vanquished at the end of Brahma's lifetime. At the end of Brahma's day, there's a partial devastation. So these two unmanifested states is another, un, beside these two unmanifested states, there is another unmanifested state, the spiritual atmosphere or nature. So it's unmanifested, but it's there, it, it's spiritual, it's not material, so it appears to be unmanifested. So there are a great number of spiritual planets in this atmosphere, and these planets exist eternally. Even when all the planets within this material universe are vanquished, at the end of Brahma's life, there are many material universes, each under the jurisdiction of a Brahma, and this cosmic manifestation within the jurisdiction of the various Brahmas is but a display of one-fourth of the energy of the Lord, Eka Padvibhuti. This is the inferior energy. Beyond the jurisdiction of Brahma is the spiritual nature, which is called Tripadvibhuti, three-fourths of the Lord's energy. This is the superior energy, or Paraprakriti. So Prabhupada is describing to us how there's the spiritual realm, which is much greater than the material realm. Lord Brahma is in the material realm. He's in one universe, and there are many universes in the material sky. So this creation of the material world, this is just one-fourth of the energy of the Lord. So it's called Ekapad Vibhuti. But the spiritual sky, beyond the region of the material world, the spiritual sky is three-fourths, and that is called Tripad Vibhuti. So this is, this is the superior energy, or Paraprakriti. The predominating Supreme Person residing within the spiritual nature is Lord Sri Krishna. As confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita, he can be approached only by unalloyed devotional service and not by the processes of Gyan philosophy, yoga, mysticism, or karma, fruit of work. The karmis or fruit, fruit of workers can elevate themselves to the swarga planets, which include the sun and the moon. Jnanis and yogis can attain still higher planets, such as Mahar Loka, Tapa Loka, and Brahma Loka. And when they, begin, when they become still more qualified through devotional service, they can enter into the spiritual nature, either the illuminating cosmic atmosphere of the spiritual sky or the Vaikuntha planets, according to their qualification. It is certain, however, that no one can enter into the spiritual Vaikuntha planets without being trained in devotional service. So Srila Prabhupada is describing the destination of different people, different living entities. Uh, the karmis, 
can only go up to the heavenly region, the Swarga planets. That includes places like the sun planet and the moon planet. They're heavenly bodies. And the jnanis and yogis, they may be very powerful. They may be able to go up to the topmost planets in the material universe, like Maharloka, Taparloka, and Brahmaloka. There are four planets up there, Janaloka also there. So these four planets are way up at the top of the universe, and that's generally where the jnanis and yogis will go. But if you want to go beyond the material world, if you want to enter into the spiritual sky, then you have to be a devotee. Without devotional service, no one can enter into the spiritual nature. So in the spiritual nature is the region of the Vaikuntha planets. And to enter into the Vaikuntha planets, you must be a devotee. You have to be engaged in devotional service. Prabhupada's purport continues, on the material planets, everyone from Brahma down to the ant is trying to lord it over material nature. And this is the material disease. As long as this material disease continues, the living entity has to undergo the process of bodily change. Whether he takes the form of a man, demigod, or animal, he ultimately has to endure an unmanifested condition during the two devastations. The devastation during the night of Brahma and the devastation at the end of Brahma's life. If we want to put an end to this process of repeated birth and death, as well as the concomitant factors of old age and disease, we must try to enter the spiritual planets where we can live eternally in the association of Lord Krishna or his plenary expansions, his Narayana forms. Lord Krishna or his plenary expansions dominate every one of the, these innumerable planets, a fact confirmed in the Shruti mantras, Eko Vasi Sarvaga Krishna Idya, Eko Pisan Bahuda Yovabhuti, from the Gopal Tapani Upanishad. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada is describing nobody can enter into the Vaikuntha planets without being a devotee. So long as we have the material disease, the desire to enjoy the material world, we will remain in the material world. But if we want to enter into the spiritual planets, we have to develop our devotion. We have to cultivate our our relationship with Lord Krishna. Srila Prabhupada continues, no one can dominate Krishna. It is the conditioned soul who tries to dominate material nature and is instead subjected to the laws of material nature and the sufferings of repeated birth and death. The Lord comes here to re-establish the principles of religion. And the basic principle is the development of an attitude of surrender to him. This is the Lord's last instruction in the Bhagavad Gita. Sarva dharmam parigyajna mamikam sharanambraja. Give up all other processes and just surrender unto me alone. Unfortunately, foolish men have misinterpreted 
this prime teaching and mislead the masses of people in diverse ways. People have been urged to open hospitals, but not to educate themselves to enter into the spiritual kingdom by devotional service. They have been taught to take interest only in temporary relief work, which can never bring real happiness to the living entity. They start varieties of public and semi-government institutions to tackle the devastating power of nature, but they don't know how to pacify insurmountable nature. Many men are advertised as great scholars of the Bhagavad Gita, but they overlook the Gita's message by which material nature can be pacified. Powerful nature can be pacified only by the awakening of God consciousness, as clearly pointed out in the Bhagavad Gita. 7.14. So, in this paragraph here, Srila Prabhupada is describing the process by which we can take ourselves out of the material world. We have to surrender to Krishna, right? The process is to surrender, to take shelter of the Lord. And that surrendering process requires that we have to cultivate the mood of devotee. We should be humble. We should be without pride. We have to give up all other processes and just take shelter of devotional service. Right, Prabhupada at the end, it's a 7.14, Bhagavad Gita 7.14, Devihi Esha Gunamayi, Mama Maya Duratyaya, Mam Eva Ye Prapadyante Mayami Tam Tarantite. The material nature is very difficult to overcome, but if one surrenders to Krishna, he can easily cross beyond it. So, the process of devotional service is to take us out of this wheel of birth and death to give us relief from the material world. People, Prabhupada goes, he gives many examples of uh, how people are trying to solve the problems in the material world. They're doing things like opening hospitals, and they're doing things like Uh, they're doing things like giving temporary relief, doing relief work to help the poor or to help the old people, different public and semi-government institutions to try to help people to overcome the laws of material nature, to solve the problems of their life. Maybe they will give them food. <coughs> <coughs> they may give shelter. They try to provide facilities to overcome the problems of material existence. But they can never overcome the problems of material life just by material science. The, the laws, the miseries of material nature will continue. There will, the, and there will continue to be old age, disease and death. We may cure one disease, then there'll be another, more lethal disease. And it happens all the time. We get more and more miseries of the material world. We want to understand the real solution, and that is to surrender to Krishna. 
So, Srila Prabhupada continues. He says, In this mantra, Sri Ishopanishad teaches that one must perfectly know both Sambhuti, in other words, the personality of Godhead, and Vinasha, the temporary material manifestation. Side by side, we should know both the Lord and the material manifestation together. By knowing the material manifestation alone, one cannot be saved. For in the course of nature, there is devastation at every moment. And Prabhupada quotes this famous verse, Ahani, Ahani, Bhutani, Gaschantiyam, Gaschanti, Gaschantihayamalayam. Yeah. Ayani, Ahani, Bhutani, Gaschantihayamalayam. In other this this is a, from the verse which says, everyone, every living entity is going to die. And no one will, will escape going to Yamaraj because that's the law of material nature. So Prabhupada said there is devastation at every moment. There is devastation at every moment. You've got devastation at the end of Brahma's day and you've got devastation at the end of Brahma's life. But at every moment there is devastation. Try to understand no one can be saved from these devastations by the opening of hospitals. One can be saved only by complete knowledge of the eternal life of bliss and awareness. The whole Vedic scheme is meant to educate men in this art of attaining eternal life. People are often misguided by temporary attractive things based on sense gratification. But service rendered to the sense objects is both misleading and degrading. So, as Srila Prabhupada says, we, we cannot solve the problems just by opening hospitals. Although people may feel very good about opening hospitals, it doesn't stop people from getting sick. It doesn't stop people from dying. It doesn't, doesn't stop disease. The real solution to the problem is to develop Krishna consciousness, to develop our eternal life in relationship with the Lord. But we get influenced by the material energy. We, be, we think there's so many other things to enjoy in the material world. And we think anyway, the problems will come. Let me worry about it when they come. Let me enjoy for now. And when the problems come, then I'll worry about it. So that is our mistake. We shouldn't think like that. Rather, we should understand the urgency to become Krishna conscious now. We shouldn't waste time because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Just to finish the purport, we must therefore save ourselves and our fellow man in the right way. There is no question of liking or disliking the truth. It is there. If we want to be saved from repeated birth and death, we must take to the devotional service of the Lord. There can be no compromise, for this is a matter of necessity. So in this way, Srila Prabhupada uh, emphasizes the need for Krishna consciousness. If we want to be saved from birth and death, we must take to the devotional service. There is no other solution 
to the problems of the world. You know, materialistic people, they will say, oh, we should build more hospitals. We have to have more homes for the old people. We need orphanages. We need to grow more food for the poor people. And we'll, have, we'll come up with many different uh, things which we need to do for the benefit of the world. But the real problem is birth and death. And the only solution to that is to take to devotional service, which means everyone has to be trained how to surrender to Krishna. By surrendering to Krishna, then one can cross over the material nature. Okay, are there any questions on this mantra number 14? Anyone has any questions? Mantra 14? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, uh, Maharaj, uh, may I ask you a question, Maharaj? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, at times, uh, like you said that, um, you know, uh, in Krishna consciousness, we are not, uh, we should not compromise and things like that. Let's say, yes. Maharaj, when there's times and circumstances where we are not, like, for example, let's say that we are not able uh, to cook anything or we are not able to do uh, like a deity worship or anything and we are traveling. During times like this, Maharaj, what are we uh, supposed to do or what are we able to do, Maharaj? Well, when we're traveling, we still have to eat. We still have to cook. You know, I travel a lot. So, yeah, I used to, and when I first started traveling, I used to always kept, keep with me a pot and I had a hot plate, and I had my pot, a stainless steel pot, with a good bottom, and, you know, I would cook for myself. And I lived like that for a, quite a long time. So you, you have to make arrangements, you have to learn to take care of yourself in different situations, just like Srila Prabhupada went to America he took his uh, cooker with him. He had that tier, he had a three-tier cooker. You know, he cooked some dal on the bottom and some rice and then some sabji and stuff. And he had that tier, he had, a, he had, he had the whole thing worked out, cooking on a, a three-tier cooker. And in this way, he was able to meet his needs. So we have to we have to also adjust things to suit our needs. You understand? Uh, yes, Maharaj. And how about uh, deities, Maharaj, in this kind of uh, uh, situations? Well, we're encouraged to be very careful about installing deities. You know, with, if you're not sure that, about being able to take care of them then you don't want to be installing deities. And it's not very good to go traveling with deities also. The deity should stay. The deities should have their own residence. And they should be able to stay there. Srila Prabhupada didn't like very much that we would take the deities out. There are sometimes, you know, like Utsava deity, the small deity, and so the small deity could go on a palanquin once a week, could go on a palanquin, be taken around the temple. But generally, you, you know, if you're going traveling, you don't want to be uh, taking deities with you. What you can do, you can worship the deity mentally Maybe you have a photograph of the deity. You can worship that de deity in your mind. Make arrangements for the worship in the mind. Manasa Puja. Mm -hmm. You understand? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Also, Maharaj, I have another question. Um, I do not know if this is... Um, something that I should ask in the class like my son he has his own personal deities uh, Goranitai 
uh, Jagannath and everything. And whenever we travel, uh, he tend to carry, sometimes I tend to tell him, uh, do not carry your deities, you know, it's almost not practical for us to feed them and things like that. But what he would do is he will make an effort to carry them wherever we are going. And uh, during times like this, Maharaj, is it advisable for him to carry deities? Uh, but uh, when he carry deities, actually, in a way, it's like making us to be disciplined for us to cook. Like um, recently when we traveled, he brought his deities and Keshwa made sure that... Uh, yeah, Keshwa made sure that we at least cook one meal a day so that we're able to offer to the deities and we honor it as prashadam. So is this uh, things like this, Maharaj, is it something for us uh, uh, practical to be done, Maharaj? Well, it's very nice devotion. I mean, it's unusual. Uh, I know uh, Prabhupada did not encourage sannyasis that they had to take deities with them he, he told them you know sannyas you don't you shouldn't you shouldn't carry a deity with you because a sannyasi like does a lot a lot of traveling however your your son goes traveling with you i mean I won't be doing a lot of traveling i don't think and he is attached to doing the deity worship it's very nice so he took the deities with him and make arrangements for feeding them. Very good. Very praiseworthy. At, oh. the same, at the same time, you have to be careful not to overdo it and to do too much traveling and the deity never gets a chance to be at home. The deity needs to also be in one place, you see. Um, okay, Maharaj, I understand. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Okay. Any other question there? Uh, Guru Maharaj, my humble obeisances. Uh, Guru Maharaj, um, the, there is uh, the ma Manava Seda, Manava Seva, Madava Seva. There is a uh, term like that right service to mankind is service to god uh, i uh, just i was uh, telling about uh, this to one devotee uh, from the sri sampradaya line she is telling that um, since uh, all the uh, living beings are parts and parcel of krishna and uh, maybe not in this birth maybe in next birth or something they are going to go back to krishna so um, Serving uh, even them will uh, please Krishna, something like this, Guru Maharaj. I was wondering how to how to understand this. Like how how can we prove how can we prove that this uh, this uh, term is not uh, correct philosophically correct that service to all of the living entities uh, is uh, not exactly service to God. Well, we. We have to explain to them that you may serve mankind. How many men can you serve? How many people can you serve? Just like in a, a city in India, there's so many people. How many people you can actually serve? We talk about serving service to man is service to God. But how many men you can serve? How many people you can feed? And you feed them one day, next day they're hungry again. So what kind of, you, you have not really solved, you've not done anything to meet the problems. You, a very small portion of the population how many people you can feed? You feed a hundred people, oh, we think, oh, very great, I fed a hundred people. But there's thousands and millions of people. And why only the people? God consciousness should be for everyone, should be beneficial for every living entity. It's not just only serving the people, that is simply humanitarian work. We want to give the mercy, give mercy 
to every living entity. And we want to give them the greatest benefit. And the greatest benefit is not just simply giving them some bread and soup. Yeah. Yes, Guru Maharaj. So we want to understand the real goal that people, some people, they, they're going hungry. Okay, we can give prasadam. But we, we give prasadam not only to the hungry, we give prasadam to everyone. And we give to all living entities. Even the dogs shouldn't go hungry. <laughs> We always we even try to feed the dogs. So we, we want to see Krishna consciousness on the highest platform, that is for the benefit of all living entities, not just simply people, but for every living entity. And the best benefit we can do for them is to chant Hare Krishna, let them hear the holy name. People may say, oh, I have no money, I'm not rich. Oh, you don't have to be rich. We just want you to chant loudly. Go outside and sing the Maha Mantra and give Krishna consciousness to people. Okay? Yeah, yes, Guru Maharaj. Any other question? Okay, then we'll go on to mantra number 15. Aranmayena patrena satyasya pehitam mukam tatvam pushana pavarano satya dharmaya dristaye. Translation O oh my Lord, sustainer of all that lives, your real face is covered by your dazzling effulgence. Kindly remove that covering and exhibit yourself to your pure devotee. So this is a, a nice verse, often quoted. And you can see it's a prayer. The, the devotee is praying to the Lord that please remove that covering. What's the covering? The dazzling effulgence. I don't want to just see the dazzling effulgence. I want to see your form. I want to see your beautiful form, your attractive features. So the devotee is praying to the Lord, kindly remove that covering and show yourself to me. So very nice verse. Devotees, we can also pray like this. Purport from Srila Prabhupada. In Bhagavad Gita, the Lord explains his personal rays, Brahma Jyoti, the dazzling effulgence of his personal form in this way. Brahmano hi pratistaham amritasya vayasya cha Shasvatasya cha dharmasya sukasya ikanti kasya cha. I am the basis of the impersonal Brahman, which is immortal, imperishable, and eternal, and is the constitutional position of ultimate happiness. Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan are three aspects of the same absolute truth. Brahman is the aspect most easily perceived by the beginner. Paramatma, the super soul, is realized by those who have further progressed. And Bhagavan realization is the ultimate realization of the absolute truth. This is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna says that he is the ultimate concept of the Absolute Truth. Therefore, 
Krishna is the source of the Brahma Jyoti, as well as the all-pervading Paramatma. Later in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna further explains. Atava bahunaitena kim gyatena tavajuna vistabhyaham idam krishnam ekam shena sito jagat. But what need? Haribo? What's going on? Is it my microphone? But what need is there, Arjuna, for all this detailed knowledge? Can you hear me? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. You hear me okay? Yes, yes Maharaj. Okay. But what need is there, Arjuna, for all this detailed knowledge? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support this entire universe. Thus, by his one plenary expansion, the all-pervading Paramatma, the Lord maintains the complete material cosmic creation. He also maintains all manifestations in the spiritual world. Therefore, in this Shruti Mantra of Sri Shupanishad, the Lord is addressed as Pushan, the ultimate maintainer. All right, so this is very important uh, points which are being made here. We should be familiar with these things. First of all, Prabhupada quotes chapter 14, text 27 where Lord Krishna described that uh, how a devotee should be situated, especially when he is uh, confronted by the material energy. So we have to understand the Lord is the basis of the Brahman. Right, chapter 14, Lord Krishna was speaking about the modes of material nature. And at the end of the chapter, they were asking how to overcome the material nature. And Lord Krishna described mamchayova yabicharena bhakti yogena sevate, that simply by doing devotional service without falling down, then we can overcome the material energy. And then, at the end of the chapter, Lord Krishna quotes this verse where he says that he is the basis of the Brahman. Now, this is an important point because sometimes people think that the Brahman is the basis of Krishna. And they think Lord Krishna comes from the Brahman. They fail to understand that the Brahman comes from Lord Krishna. It's Lord Krishna who is the basis of everything, not the Brahman. So the Gyanis and the Vedantists, they often misunderstand and they, they consider the Brahman to be everything. But it's very clear from text number 1427 of the Bhagavad Gita, as stated here, Krishna is the basis of the impersonal Brahman. And the nature of that Brahman is described immortal, imperishable, and eternal. And it's the constitutional position of ultimate happiness. So Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan are three aspects of the Absolute Truth. And Brahman, Prabhupada explains, is the most easily perceived by the beginner. Yeah, people understand the Brahman. It's easy that, that we, we, we see everything as being Brahman and we understand we're also Brahman. We're living entities. We're sparks of the Brahman. So it's not very difficult to understand this 
uh, portion of the Lord, which is the Brahman. It's one feature of the absolute truth. And above that, then you come to Paramatma, which is for the yogis. The yogis who are meditating on the super soul, they will realize the Lord in his Paramatma feature. But if we want to know the Lord in full, the ultimate realization, then that is the Bhagavan feature. And in order to know that, you have to surrender to Krishna. You have to be a devotee. So then Prabhupada quotes an important verse from Bhagavad Gita 7.7, 7, where Krishna says that I am the base, Krishna said, there is no truth superior to me. Lord Krishna said, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests on me, just like pearls are strung on a thread. So Krishna is the source of the Brahma Jyoti. And Krishna is also the source of the Paramatma. It all comes from him. And Prabhupada supports this with the Bhagavad Gita verse from the 10th chapter, where Lord Krishna had been describing his vibhutis. And then at the end of the chapter, he said, but what need is there, O Arjuna, for all of this detailed knowledge? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support the entire creation. And that single fragment of Lord Krishna, that is Paramatma. The Paramatma expands everywhere. So this is Lord Krishna's fragmental portion. But by that portion of Paramatma, he's maintaining the whole cosmic creation. That one Paramatma, which is expanded in the hearts of all living entities and in every atom, it's maintaining the entire creation. So everything is being maintained by Lord Krishna. So Prabhupada quotes this word, Pushan. Pushanikarsya yamasurya prajapatya vayuharas minsa muhateja. Like that Pushan, the maintainer, the ultimate maintainer, Lord Sri Krishna. <coughs> Srila Prabhupada continues, The personality of Godhead Sri Krishna is always filled with transcendental bliss. Ananda Mayo Bayasat. When he was present at Vrindavan in India 5,000 years ago, he always remained in transcendental bliss, even from the beginning of his childhood pastimes. The killing of various demons such as Aga, Baka, Puran, Putana, and Pralamba were but pleasure excursions for him. In his village of Rindavan, he enjoyed himself with his mother, brother, and friends. And when he played the role of a naughty but butter thief, all his associates enjoyed celestial bliss by his stealing. The Lord's fame as a butter thief is not reproachable. For by stealing butter, the Lord gave pleasure to his pure devotees. Everything the Lord did in Vrindavan was for the pleasure of his associates there. The Lord created these pastimes to attract the dry speculators and the acrobats of the so-called Hatha Yoga system who wish to find the absolute truth. Srila Prabhupada is describing to us some of the wonderful pastimes of Lord Krishna. How Lord Krishna could give pleasure to so many different people. And at the same time, he's also killing the demons. 
So he's giving pleasure to his devotees by removing the demons from the world. Devotees, his devotees become very blissful when they see Lord Krishna remove the different demons away from them. Because the, the devotees are naturally uh, full of love of Krishna and they just want, simply want Lord Krishna. They don't want to be uh, away from Lord Krishna for any length of time. Then Srila Prabhupada tells us about how Lord Krishna's pastimes are never understood by these jnanis and speculators and the great yogis also. They may be very great ac 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 acrobats. They can perform wonderful balancing feats as they stretch and twist their bodies. But they're very far away from the absolute truth. Ultimately, the goal of all yoga is to come to know the absolute truth. And the only way we can know the absolute truth is by the grace of the absolute truth. The Lord himself can reveal himself to his devotees. Prabhupada's purport continues. Of the, of the childhood play between the Lord and his playmates, the cowherd boy Sukadeva Goswami says in Srimad Bhagavatam, Itam satam brahma sukhanabhutya dasyam gatanam paradaivatena my ashritanam Naradarakena Sakam Vijadru Kritapunya Punja. Oh, so, this is a verse describing the cowherd boys. Uh, because Lord Krishna enjoys his pastimes with the cowherd boys. When he goes to the forest every day, every morning, as soon as they wake up in the morning, the cow boys want to go to be with Lord Krishna. And they go running to be with Lord Krishna. They will go to the home of Nanda and Yashoda and they will help to dress Lord Krishna in the morning. And they will take great pleasure to see the Lord beautifully dressed and anointed with a nice flower garland and with nice tea lac and so on. So Prabhupada quotes this important verse about Lord Krishna being with the cowherd boys. He said, the personality of Godhead, who is perceived as the impersonal, blissful Brahman by the jnanis, who is worshipped as the Supreme Lord by devotees in the mood of servitorship, and who is considered an ordinary human being by mundane people, played with the cowherd boys who had attained their position after accumulating many pious activities. So try to understand the position of the cowherd boys who are these uh, associates of Lord Krishna in his pastimes, that the cowherd boys are not just simply ordinary village boys, but they're very, very great souls who somehow or other are so fortunate they can have the personal association of Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram, and they can go into the forest, enjoy with the calves, and even take the cows for some bathing. So the, the cowherd boys are described, Krita Punya Punja, that they perform pious activities over many lifetimes 
And that's why they're able to be with the Lord, to take part in his pastimes. So the verse also, the Sukadeva Goswami describes different people. He said, uh, the Lord, the personality of Godhead, is perceived as the impersonal Brahman by the Gyanis. So for the Gyanis, their goal is simply to know the Brahman. And he's worshipped as the Supreme Lord by devotees in the mood of servitorship. So Dasya, Dasya Ras, that's the mood of Vaikuntha, the residence of Vaikuntha. So they worship the Lord by the, and they worship the Lord in the mood of being servants, Dasya Ras. And at the same time, he is considered an ordinary human being by mundane people. So the ordinary mundane people, they see the Lord as simply being an ordinary person. Abhijananti mamudha manushim tanam ashrita. The foolish mock at me, descending amongst them like a human being. They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. So Sukadeva Goswami is describing the vision of different people and most of all he glorifies the cowherd boys because the cowherd boys they had attained their position to be playing with Krishna after many many pious activities. And that's why they're so fortunate to be able to be with Lord Krishna and take part in his pastimes. Srila Prabhupada's purport continues. Thus the Lord is always engaged in transcendental loving activities with his spiritual associates in the various relationships Santa, neutrality, Dashya, servitorship, Sakya, friendship, Vatsalya, parental affection, and Madhurya, conjugal love. So we see in different places with different people, the Lord will enjoy different dealings with them. He will enjoy different kinds of uh, exchanges with them. Some people will be in the mood of Dashara. Generally, that's the predominant mood in Vaikuntha. But in Goloka, the mood is greater. In Goloka, you have um, you have Vatsal, you have Madhurya Ras, of course. You have Madhurya Ras, and you have a lot of Madhurya between the devotees in Vrindavan and and Lord Krishna. All right, Prabhupada purport continues. Since it is said that Lord Krishna never leaves Vrindavan Dham, one may ask how he manages the affairs of the creation. So, Lord Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. So, somebody may want to know how can he manage the whole creation? If he's going to stay in Vrindavan all the time, how can he take care of things in the material world? So this is answered by verses in 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna says that he pervades the entire material creation by his plenary part known as the Paramatma or Super Soul. So by his plenary portion, he pervades and supports the entire creation. Right? We quoted that verse. So the Lord, the, the Lord is pervading everything. Although the Lord personally has nothing to do with material creation, maintenance, and destruction, he causes all these things to be done 
by his plenary expansion, the Paramatma. So the Lord is the super soul in the heart and he inspires the Paramatma to take care of these things. Every living entity is known as Atma or soul and the principal Atma who controls them all is Param Atma, the super soul. This system of God realization is a great science. All right, so Prabhupada posed the question and then answered it for us that the Lord is everywhere. At the same time, he always resides in Goloka Vrindavan. But by his expansion as Paramatma, he's able to maintain and oversee everything in the material creation. Prabhupada continued, this system of God realization is a great science. The materialistic Sankhya yogis can only analyze and meditate on the 24 factors of the material creation, for they have very little information of the Purusha, the Lord. The impersonal transcendentalists are simply bewildered by the glaring effulgence of the Brahma Jyoti. If one wants to see the absolute truth in full, one has to penetrate beyond the 24 material elements and the glaring effulgence as well. Sri Ishopanishad points towards this direction, praying for the removal of the Haranmaya Patra, the dazzling covering of the Lord. Unless this covering is removed, so one can perceive the real face of the personality of Godhead, Factual realization of the absolute truth can never be achieved. So the, the Brahma Jyoti is what is covering the face of the Lord. And that has to be removed if we want to actually perfect our meditation on the Lord. We want to be able to actually see the form and the qualities of the Lord. We don't just want to see only the partial presentation. We want to see the Lord in full. We want to know the Lord in completeness. Srila Prabhupada's purport continues, the Paramatma feature of the Personality of Godhead is one of three plenary expansions or Vishnu Tattvas, ultimately known as the Purusha Avatars. So the, the Paramatma feature is one of the three expansion. Paramatma feature is also uh, Shirodaka Shai Vishnu, right? You have Maha Vishnu or Karana Daka Shai Vishnu, and then you have Garbo Daka Shai Vishnu, and then you have Shiro Daka Shai Vishnu. So of these of these three Vishnu Tattvas, one of these three who is within the universe is known as Shiro Dakashai Vishnu. He is the Vishnu among the three principal deities, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. And he is the all-pervading Paramatma in each and every individual living entity. The second Vishnu Tattva within the universe is Garbhodakashai Vishnu, the collective super soul 
of all living entities. Beyond these two is Karanadakasai Vishnu, who lies in the Kosho Ocean. He is the creator of all universes. The yoga system teaches the serious student to meet the Vishnu Tattvas after going beyond the 24 material elements of the cosmic creation. The culture of empiric philosophy helps one realize the impersonal Brahma Jyoti, which is the glaring effulgence of the transcendental body of Lord Sri Krishna. That the Brahma Jyoti is Krishna's effulgence is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 1427 as well as Brahma Samhita. <coughs> so Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us how Lord Vishnu expands in different ways for the purpose of the creation of the material universes. <coughs> There are three Vishnu expansions. Karana Dakeshai Vishnu, Lord Maha Vishnu, who is laying in the Kosho Ocean. Then from the body of Maha Vishnu comes out the universes. They come out like pores, like drops of water or perspiration may come out from our body. So the same way perspiration came out from the body of the devotees, came out from the body of the Lord, and, and it came out in the form of universes. So then the Lord enters into each universe as Garbhodakashai Vishnu. And as Garbhodakashai Vishnu, first of all, he creates the ocean in the bottom of each universe. And on that ocean he will lay down. And when he lays down, then the lotus flower will come out from the navel of Garbhodakashai Vishnu. And from that lotus flower, Lord Brahma will take birth. So that's Garbhodakashai Vishnu. But there's the other expansion of Vishnu, Shirodakashai Vishnu. And Shirodakashai Vishnu is a super soul in the hearts of all living entities. And Prabhupada also points out that that Paramatma feature, that is also the Vishnu among Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Vishnu means the empowered incarnation of the, the, the expansion of Paramatma. So we have the three Vishnu expansions, Garbhodakshayi Vishnu, the collective super soul, or the second Vishnu Tattva. So Srila Prabhupada explains we can meet the Vishnu Tattvas by going beyond the 24 material elements. Indeed, it's described in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, also in the Krishna book. You can read how Arjuna went with Lord Krishna and they went through the coverings of the universe and they entered into the uh, region, into the Kosho Ocean where Lord Mahavishnu was residing. So it was there that the that Krishna and the coward boy they brought back Arjuna from the, they not brought Arjuna but they brought back the Brahmana's children. Arjuna had gone with Lord Krishna because the Brahmana's children had been dying, and the, actually what happened they were being taken away by Mahavishnu, but Lord Krishna went with Arjuna. And they went into that region and they brought back the, the dead sons of the Brahmana. 
So that was by going through the covering of the universe. We want to go beyond the covering of the universe into the transcendental region. First there is a, the region of transcendence. And from that transcendence, then they can enter into the spiritual world. So then Prabhupada quotes this verse. Uh, yasya Prabha Prabhavato Jagadanda Koti Kotesh Vasesha Vasudati Vibhuti Binnam Tad Brahma Nishkalam Anantam Asesha Bhutam Govinda Madhipusham Tamaham Bajamin So Lord Brahma's prayer is in the millions and millions of universes there are innumerable planets and each and every one of them is different from the others by its cosmic constitution. All of these planets are situated in a corner of the Brahma Jyoti and this Brahma Jyoti is but the personal rays of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Govinda whom I worship. So you can see how the Brahma Jyoti is being described, the, the rays which come from the body of the Lord. It's not that the Lord comes from the Brahma Jyoti, but everything comes from the Lord. All right, and then this means, this, this mantra from the Brahma Samhita is spoken from the platform of factual realization of the absolute truth. And the Shruti mantra of Sri Shupanishad under discussion confirm this mantra as a process of realization. The Ishopanishad mantra is a simple prayer to the Lord to remove the Brahma Jyoti so that one can see his real face. The Brahma Jyoti effulgence is described in detail in several mantras of the Mundaka Upanishad. So uh, you can see Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us that there's some other presentation from the Vedas from the Mundaka Upanishad. And in the Mandaka Upanishad, we get information about the Brahma Jyoti effulgence. So there are a few verses there, right? Three verses, we won't read them, but we'll read through the translation. In the spiritual realm, beyond the material covering, is the unlimited Brahman effulgence which is free from material contamination. That effulgent white light is understood by transcendentalists to be the light of all lights. In that realm, there is no need of sunshine, moonshine, fire, or electricity. For a or electricity for illumination. Indeed, whatever illumination appears in the material world is only a reflection of that supreme illumination. That Brahman is in front and in back, in the north, south, east and west, and also overhead and below. In other words, that Supreme Brahman effulgence spreads throughout both the material and spiritual skies. So you can see uh, the Brahman is described very powerfully, very elaborately. The Supreme Brahman and it spreads not only in the spiritual worlds, but also in the material worlds. So that 
Brahma Jyoti is described that white light and is to be the it's the light of all lights so it, it, it illuminates everything but just simply to see this light that is not the real goal we have to understand that we should not become attracted just simply by the light but we want to go through the light to see the covering the light is covering the Lord's face and we have to remove the light. So one time Srila Prabhupada was teaching the devotees and he got everyone to chant Japa and one girl was chanting and then suddenly she said to Prabhupada, she said, Oh Swamiji, when I chant, I see a light, I see this great light. And Prabhupada told her, he said, don't worry, keep chanting, it will go away. So Prabhupada was not very impressed that she was seeing some light. That is not the goal of our chanting. Rather, we chant the holy name of the Lord to develop our love for Krishna and that we will become more inspired to serve the Lord and to do service for the pleasure of the Lord. So the Brahma Jyoti is described like this, we'll read more. Perfect knowledge means knowing Krishna as the root of this Brahman effulgence. This knowledge can be gained from such scriptures as Srimad Bhagavatam, which perfectly elaborates the science of Krishna. In Srimad Bhagavatam, the author Srila Vyasadeva has established that one will describe the supreme truth as Brahman, Paramatma or Bhagavan according to one's realization of him. Srila Vyasadeva never states that the supreme truth is a jiva, an ordinary living entity. The living entity should never be considered the all-powerful supreme truth. If he were the supreme, he would not need to pray to the Lord to remove his dazzling cover so that the living entity could see his real face. So, Srila Prabhupada is describing to us how some people, they know the Lord as the Brahman. And they will say ultimately the Brahman is the Supreme. And they will even claim that when Lord Krishna comes into this world, that he is a manifestation of the Brahman. So different people, different people have different realizations of the Lord. The yogis, they realize the Lord in the Paramatma feature. And the Gyanis, they realize the Lord in the Brahma Jyoti. The Karmis, they simply realize the material world. So Srila Vyasadev, he has described the Absolute Truth as being Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. All right, Vedanti Tattva Tattvam Vidam Tattyam Yat Brahma Advayam Brahmati Paramatmati Bhagavan Iti Shabhyate. Learned transcendentalists who know the absolute truth call this non dual substance as Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So ultimately, there is nothing but the Lord, but He is there in different features. So we want to understand the Lord fully. And the, the worst thing which we can do is to think that the Lord is an ordinary jiva. We should understand that the, the Lord is not an ordinary jiva, but he is the supreme being. We say, Ekala Ishwara Krishna ar sab There is one supreme Lord, supreme controller, 
and all others are his servants. So even though we may be given a big job as an assistant, but still we are the servants. We should never think that we are on the level of the Lord. We are simply there as servants of the Lord. Uh -huh. And that's why the living entities here, that we pray to the Lord to remove his effulgence. We want to see his real face. The conclusion, Prabhupada continues, is that one who has no knowledge of the potencies of the Supreme Truth will realize the impersonal Brahman. Similarly, when one realizes the material potencies of the Lord, but has little or no information of the spiritual potencies, he attains Paramatma realization. Thus, both Brahman and Paramatma realization of the Absolute Truth are partial realizations. However, when one realizes the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, in full potency, after the removal of the Haranmaya Patra, one realizes Vasudev Sarvam Iti, Lord Sri Krishna, who is known as Vasudev, is everything. Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. He is Bhagavan, the root, and Brahman and Paramatma are his branches. So in this way, Srila Prabhupada is establishing to us the different features of the Lord, how the Lord is present. Some know him as simply as the Brahman, the impersonal Brahman, Others know the Lord in his all-pervading feature as the super soul within the hearts of everyone. And others know him fully, the full realization of the Lord, when they know him as Bhagavan, as the personality of Godhead, full of all opulences. And Prabhupada quotes from Bhagavad Gita, the Vasudev Sarvam Iti, Samahatma Sadhulabha. After many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge, he will surrender to me. So this is uh, the goal of knowledge is to surrender to Lord Krishna, who is also known as Vasudev. We'll just finish this purport here. In the Bhagavad Gita, 6, 46, 47, in other words, the last two verses of the Bhagavad Gita, 6th chapter, there is a comparative analysis of the three types of transcendentalists, the worshippers of the impersonal Brahman, the Jnanis, the worshippers of the Paramatma feature, the Yogis, and the devotees of Lord Sri Krishna, Bhaktas. It is stated there that the jnanis, those who have cultivated Vedic knowledge, are better than ordinary fruitive workers. That the yogis are still greater than the jnanis. And that among all yogis, those who constantly serve the Lord, with all their energies, are the topmost. In summary, a philosopher is better than a laboring man. A mystic is superior to a philosopher. And of all the mystic yogis, he who follows bhakti yoga constantly, engaging in the service of the Lord, is the highest. Sri Ishopanishad directs us towards this perfection. All right, so Prabhupada is explaining the hierarchy 
between the different types of transcendentalists. They're all transcendentalists. They've all realized that they're not the body, but at the same time, there are differences. First of all, we have the worshippers of the Brahman, the Jnanis, or sometimes they're called Vedantists. So they worship the Brahman and they say, ultimately, there's only the Brahman. Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, Shankaracharya popularized the statement from the scriptures that everything is Brahman. So yes, everything is Brahman, but there's also Parabrahman. So we point out to people, don't stop at the Brahman, there's also Parabrahman. So there's the jnanis, and then the worshippers of the, the Paramatma, the yogis, and then you have the devotees, the bhaktas. So the jnanis, they've, they cultivate Vedic knowledge. They're, the jnanis are better than the ordinary karmi. The karmis, they just want to enjoy the material world. They're called the fruit of workers. So above the karmis are the jnanis. And above the jnanis, you have the yogis. And said the yogis are greater than the jnanis. And among all yogis, we have our devotees. The best of all yogis is the one who is surrendered to Krishna. The, 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 the devotee is the topmost because they constantly serve the Lord with all their energies. So they're, the, because the devotee makes a great sacrifice for the pleasure of the Lord, so he's considered the topmost yogi. And Prabhupada summarizes everything for us. He said a philosopher, in other words, jnani, is better than a laboring man, the karmi. A mystic, the yogi, is superior to the philosopher or the jnani. And of all the mystic yogis, he who follows the bhakti yoga, constantly engaging in the Lord's service, is the highest. So in this way, Sri Shopanishad directs us towards this perfection. All right, are there any questions on this mantra 15? Anyone? Yes? Uh, I have a question. Now, how do I answer? I always think of uh, Krishna within, within us as the Paramatma. And then, like, I don't know if I'm wrong, but they always refer to Krishna as the super soul. Like, Krishna and his full quality as the super soul. So now, here, uh, we're saying, we, we, uh, uh, the verse is saying that Par, uh, Paramatma, I mean, it, it's, it's saying Paramatma and the super soul are. Um, kind of the same, right? So if, if people were to ask us, oh, so the super, uh, we are the super soul and Krishna is the super soul, um, <laughs> then it, it, it gives them like uh, the space to say, and we are the super soul and Krishna. So how, how can we answer this? Your, your voice, voice hasn't been very clear. I haven't got the whole track. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, is this okay? Yeah, can you tell me? Okay, I'll, I'll 
worked harder than that. So, um, we always like, for me, I always like think of Krishna Vedinas, this Vedinas as the Paramatma. And like, when we talk about Krishna, uh, we always say he's the super soul. So, in this verse, uh, we're just saying, oh, Paramatma and the super soul are the same. So then if, if I tell people that, uh, you know, Krishna is a super soul, and, and, and then they read this and say, oh, this means that Paramatma is a super soul, and they're also a super soul within us, and they're kind of saying as Krishna. So how can I reply to this question? Well, the Paramatma, Paramatma is just an, ex, an, ex, an expansion of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is original. I don't know what's going on. Why is all this sound? What happened to our... Hare Krishna, can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. All right. So, Lord Krishna, it's... Lord Krishna expands himself as the Paramatma. First of all, Lord Krishna is out the he's the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then he expands as Balaram. And from Balaram we have Sankarshan. And from Sankarshan, then you have the Chatur Vyura, Vasudev Sankarshana Niruda Pradumna. And from that, Vasudev, then you get the Vishnu expansions this Vishnu expansion, one of which is Paramatma, or within Garbo, uh, Shiro Dakashai Vishnu. Shiro Dakashai Vishnu is Paramatma. And that same Shiro Dakashai Vishnu, that is the Vishnu in the Trinity. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. That Vishnu, that is the, in the, in the, Trinity, that is the Paramatma. So the Paramatma pervading everything, it's a feature of the Lord. The devotees, the yogis, they meditate on the Paramatma. And of course, those who are devotees to Krishna, to Krishna, I think something's wrong with your mic there. Yeah, better you. Keep your mic off for now. You see, Lord Krishna is the Paramatma. He can appear as in his Krishna form as a super soul also. He, for the devotee, it's Lord Krishna who is in the heart of everyone. Not just simply Paramatma, but it's actually Krishna who is in the heart for his devotee. Somebody may be devoted simply to the super soul, to the form of Lord Vishnu, but somebody else may be devoted to Lord Krishna. So that super soul can be transformed to the form of Lord Krishna by the supreme power of Lord Krishna. He can appear in the hearts of all living entities. So we want to understand how merciful Lord Krishna is and how he reciprocates with his devotees that he will appear in the heart. You understand? Okay, so that means uh, he can appear, but that means not always there. I mean, he's not always in our heart. Like the Paramatma is always there, right? That what you're saying? Can you can you please repeat what you're saying? Um, when you, when you 
that's great for us. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, I'm not able to hear what you're saying. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can type it, put it in the chat. Let me read it. Anybody else has a question? Anyone? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. I have yes. a question. Um, yes. Let's just say, Maharaj, um, because um, we're supposed to be in the mood of uh, we are the servant of the servant. That's how we are actually developing our relationship with Krishna. What if uh, devotees, they, uh, they want to have a relationship with Krishna, like as if um, they see Krishna as a child, or they see Krishna as a friend in that way. Um, like like as when they, ha they have deities at home. So like uh, a Mataji, she will, you know, like to cook for Krishna, like as if Krishna is a child. So in that way, is that wrong to, uh, in the early stages of Krishna consciousness, is that wrong for us to develop um, such relationship with Krishna? Or should we go for just... Uh, a servant of the servant of the Lord. Well, certainly we have to begin as in the mood of servant. That's important. <coughs> to develop prematurely an int <coughs> an intimate relationship with Krishna that will be difficult to maintain. We have to, first of all, cultivate the mood of servant. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught Jivarsvarupahaya Nitya Krishna Das. So, one who is, it, even if you are in conjugal love with the Lord, one in conjugal love is also a servant. The, prim the preliminary, the primary rasas are also there in Madhurya Ras. So primary Rasas meaning Dasya Ras and then Sakya Ras and Vatsalya Ras, they're also there in the Rasa of one who is engaged in Rasika Bhakti. To come to that stage of uh, spontaneous loving devotion for the Lord we have to progress gradually, come to that stage. Just like these cowherd boys, that they perform pious activities over many lifetimes. So, you may have a natural attraction for spontaneous love for the Lord. It must be due to previous lives. Maybe in your previous life you were already a devotee. And now again you're coming and you want to perfect your love for, for the Lord. And he's arranging for you also. He's arranging that you can help to install the deities and you can help to see the temple opened and so many things. So the Lord arranges for the devotee to progress in intimacy from Dasya to Sakya, to Vatsalya, to Madhurya. Greater and greater intimacy, greater and greater loving dealings. But within all of these rasas, Dasya rasa is there. Every one of them is a servant. So they always have the mood. Mother Yashoda, Nanda Maharaj, everyone, they're always in the mood of the servant of Lord Krishna as well as enjoying their loving dealings with him as a parent. Is it clear, Maharaji? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj.
Any other question from anyone? All right. So then we will stop here tonight. There are no more questions. And we have just a little more to go on. 16, 17, 18. So we'll try to finish soon. When is your